Welcome to the Rick and Ron podcast. It's uh, good to be with you again. I understand you just got back from holidays, right? 25th anniversary celebration. No way. Yep. And the whole family went away to uh, a warm climate for a little while. Yep. Watch the whales play sandy beaches. One of those deals. Very nice. All six of us. Yeah. So that's your whole family. So all children, husband and wife, you and Joyce had a great time. Yep. Weather was good. Yep. Lovely. It was. <laughs> yeah, nice. You know, for our 25th, we did Hawaii. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hawaii. Loved it. It was really good. Ooh. Yeah. Hey, um, listen, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, um, something that defines us, about us. And it's one of those existential kinds of questions, like, um, do you prefer Coke and Pepsi kind of thing, Ooh. right? You like Ford or Chevy and, and those kind of things. But the question is this. Oh, I don't drink pop and I don't like, uh, well, I'm an import guy. Okay, yeah. Okay, but... so let's go to the question yeah. then instead. So, Mac or PC? Oh. Like, who are you? PC. Yeah. This Mac thing has a lot of control written all over it, so I bulk against that. I'm not a control guy, and um, just think people who are controlled don't necessarily get to be at their best. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, 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 I gotta admit, I am a converted Mac guy. Oh. Yeah, I know. For years, PC, 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 loved them worked on them, got into the inner workings of them. And um, once I started in, uh, deeply into ministry, um, I started realizing uh, this Mac stuff is actually pretty cool. Okay. Yeah. So I got into it and, and I got to say, we as a family are probably pretty deeply ingrained into Apple. Probably shouldn't say that too loudly. Uh, but uh, yeah, so Mac guy. Go Steve Jobs and hey. run. <laughs> Shout out. Yeah. Thank you. Rick, um, I, I wanted you to, to share a little bit. I'm going to do a shout out to Neighborhood Life and Good Neighbor Coffee, mm -hmm. but I, I really want to give you an opportunity to share a little bit about this ministry that God's called you to. Um, so can you can you kind of fill us in a little bit? Um, how did you get to this place? And tell us a little bit about um, uh, um, Neighborhood Life and Good Neighbor Coffee. All my life, ministry seemed to ask people to come and uh, join me or us or the church and, and it's a program and you should come to that uh, next week 7 30 we have this go oh this is beautiful you should come to this and it, as i read the scriptures i i seen a lot of uh, going to them somebody actually uh, introduced me to this idea that as much as we want them to come hmm. there's this element of making them the missionary and opposed to our responsibility that's ah, debatable and i love the church there's many great programs it's it's necessary but for me i really wanted to say which i started saying to my wife what would it look like if our entire ministry was about going to the people now that's what made me think where is that place where you meet people and I couldn't help but think of neighborhoods hmm. and the fact that it's part of the summary of the commands loving your neighbor I'm not a dispensationalist or a literalist but I do know that many people love to talk about every other neighbor except their actual neighbor hmm. as to what Jesus was challenging them to do and I think there's much evidence as to who we are to our actual neighbors that that perhaps are, is forfeited maybe maybe I'm just talking about my circles but in our culture, it's become that way, uh, from what I've gleaned. And so the challenge was to try to rally the people in their neighborhoods to help them understand who they can be. And when they, when they were introduced to each other in any given neighborhood, including uh, my own, which I started with, then there was something they relished. Uh, they were part of something greater. Um, and this wasn't about being identified with a, the soccer team moms or the or the hockey team dads, or the job title. All of that are, are, are maybe things we could talk about and are great places for ministry to take place as well. But I really wanted to challenge us to where we have no titles, no transactions, and that's where we live and have our being. And that we would reclaim our presence and what that would be like in terms of those who, who would want to be Christ in their neighborhoods. Now I have to say that I have a lot of pushback. I'm not asking people to be service providers or to join Neighborhood Watch or to be motivated anything other than just simply perhaps live out of abundance and love mm. our neighbors. 
and start with those right around us. I, I wanted to uh, do this. Uh, there's many stories. In fact, I, I started roasting coffee <laughs> as a way in which I could take um, the, uh, uh, the labeling that says this is, this is good coffee and uh, turn it around to put the stories on the back, true stories that I've all uh, taken from different neighborhoods that I've been part of, and then have that sit on the shelves of local stores, which has been increasingly uh, growing uh, in, in, the, in the right direction, I must say, and has uh, helped uh, you know, label it as social entrepreneurial or, or, or ministry in a different way. Uh, but it's something that doesn't count because it doesn't have a category. Um, you can't ask me how many people come to my church, but it's a full-time missional a job that I've created in which now a couple of cities and towns and churches have been asking me to, to teach and help understand what that would be like. I got this trailer barbecue and an espresso bike and, and some other toys, including the, the stories that I bring into neighborhoods to help them understand the vision. I've I've been in, intrigued by the mission and the vision of this, um, and you know I've done some walking alongside with you when it comes to uh, trying to support this ministry. Mm -hmm. But but I find it fascinating um, that you would get some pushback, um, and and I, 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 I can get it, I, I see it, right? I I, I can understand it. Um, however, um, I wonder myself sometimes: uh, is it because of the uncomfortableness? Of, of just being this presence in your community? Uh, or is it the unknown, right? What, what, what are the people wrestling with that, that's hard for them to grasp? Well, it's everything from the guy who owns his half a million dollar home, doesn't yeah. want to jeopardize it or have anything, uh, you know, <laughs> out of whack. So it's just better to stay safe, right? Not be involved with those right around you. All the way to, uh, um, I don't get it. Um, what, what do you mean? And we've, We've been so good over the last 80 years in our culture, building non-dependency and building isolation. You know, you stay out of my business, hmm. and if you come on my backyard, and uh, that we don't even recognize the person who lives next to us as our actual neighbor that Jesus might have been talking about. Right. And people don't want to be told what to do. Yeah. Well, I get that too. Yeah. I'll do ministry in my own way. Thank you very much. And that is a great idea, by the way, loving your neighbors. But I'll, I'll just do what I do best. And that's not it. <laughs> mm. But this is just a new way of looking at things, right? It is. Some might only uh, say that it's an old school method that we're trying to reclaim, uh, which is somewhat true. I mean, there has been barn raising um, aspects to this where the people who are around the area geographically come together. Right. We redo, re redid a roof of a neighbor whose wife left him and four small children and we had everything from nominal Catholics mm -hmm. to people who cuss and swear and have no idea who Christ is and they actually all rallied to uh, redo this roof, pitched in money for it and did it in two days. It was straight too. And not only that, but some were height scared, so they did some painting. And they filled the freezer of this guy's uh, house uh, filled with uh, the lunches for the kids. Yeah. And we sat around, actually, the parents of the man whose wife left him uh, drove nine hours to see for themselves what in the world's going on because they'd never heard of anything like this before. I, and that's the story you've told me many times, which I find self-sacrifice, right? It's, it's not about me, right? It's about yeah. what we can do to help our neighbor, yeah. right? And that I just find amazing. And I think that's really cool. Nine hour drive and they show up and, and they told them a little about it and then the mom started to cry and I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> so who knows what to do? Someone hug her. <laughs> yeah. Rick, take us into the story. This one is uh, pretty weighty, mm. <laughs> excuse the pun. C.S. Lewis, The Weight of Glory, is a book that uh, maybe isn't on the top of uh, the list when it comes to C.S. Lewis books. But I'd like to read one that's in chapter 6 called The Inner Circle. And it is funny how this sets us up for today's conversation. C.S. Lewis writes, Men tell not only their wives but themselves that it is a hardship to stay late at the office or the school on some bit of important extra work which they have been let in for because they and so and so and 
the two others are the only people in the place who really know how things are run. But it's not quite true. It is a terrible bore, of course, when old Fatty Smithson draws you aside and whispers, Look, look here. We've got to get you in on this examination somehow. Or, Charles and I saw at once that you've got to be on this committee. A terrible bore, writes C.S. Lewis. Ah, but how much more terrible if you were left out. It's tiring and unhealthy to lose your Saturday afternoons. But to have them free because you don't matter is much worse. Well, he said a lot of wise things, but oh, that man. story is a, a go-getter. It, it rings true. It really, really does. And many people struggle to go and fight and spend a lot of energy and time to get to the inner circle, Ron. Well, I'll tell you, Rick, um, we had the privilege of, of pre-reading this story before we came on here. And i got to tell you, um, I was pretty angry with the story. Oh. Not, not because of the content, uh, but just the frustration of the people that sometimes I know that want to be in that inner circle. Right? That, that got to be there, that push everyone else away right, from being part of that but also to be part of the, the community. So, so what frustrates me most is that they take a um, take no prisoners kind of approach to getting to that place and those poor people kind of left to the side are just there for the scraps. Mm. That's what makes me angry sometimes when I read about this kind of inner circle kind of story. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does actually, yeah. Uh... What rings true in my mind when you uh, when you get emotional here about it? Sorry about that. No, no that's fine. Yeah. Is uh, back in high school, which brings up a lot of emotions for a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, perhaps another way of saying um, what you're saying, at all costs, getting to that inner circle, uh, makes me think of the pecking order that sometimes exists in in high schools. If we use that mm -hmm. for example teenager behavior, um, and, and who's kidding who? It's true in all of life. Adults have a pecking order. And and what I want to say is, is when we define it like that, we know that the pecking order comes from animal language, which is a, which is a behavior that belongs to the animal kingdom, hmm. not to the human kingdom. So understandably, your emotions are warranted. Well, easy going, no, easy does it. Yeah, yeah, sorry. But but I guess the other side of that is that there's a great number of people who are also very gifted and talented to be in those places of leadership, right? So what do you do with that? Mm -hmm. When it kind of conflicts with this whole kind of mentality of the inner circle, we need those leaders there. However, at what cost? So I think at the pecking order in high school, I was there once, right? I was in that place where it was just... Um, you're not good enough. Mm -hmm. You you can't be here. You're not invited to this place. I'll tell you, it was hard. When I study youth culture, even today, this interesting concept that was introduced to me uh, 25 years ago mm. still is true, and that is that in that um, element of, of formative years called teenage years, mm. um, we find that uh, they're busy, so busy, and bored at the same time. And it makes me want to think that this whole aspiration of getting to that inner circle or getting to the top of the pecking order, regardless if you're a teenager, an adult, or anywhere in between, that it is futile and meaningless because while you are so busy doing this, you, you have a whole lot of meaninglessness in your life. There's a whole lot of energy that's spent here. Yes. Right? When you think of all the energy that goes into this drive to, to be in that place, right. um, I, 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 it, it's just, why? It's pointless. Mm -hmm. Right? Because often we find we get there and those people that are in this inner circle that we, we wanted to get to, that place that we needed to get to, is really a, a grouping of people that are still fighting those same kind of insecurities. Right? Yeah. What's really here? What's really here? And C.S. Lewis actually makes that point um, in that chapter 6 of, of The Way to Glory, that yeah. when someone arrives at the inner circle, 
whatever that means, they realize that no one else is there. Kind of a mysterious uh, revelation, but um, very believable because of uh, the whole idea of what that means to be in the inner circle. Well, and it's interesting because one of the things that I find striking is, is you know, that story of, of Jesus being approached by the mother of one of the two, the two disciples, right? And saying, um, my child, can they be on your right side? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not for me to say where they are placed, right? And, and this, this place of placement, this place of position, this place of prestige, mm -hmm. right? It's this, this, this overwhelming desire, not just for power, but for, um, can they be there? Put them there because I know they're going to be safe there. This is their place. This is where they need to be. However, um, it may not be. Does that make sense? Yeah. The rich and the famous are are kind of an interesting. Not that I'm either of them. But they, they reveal something about wanting to be there, um, either rich or famous, uh, only to somehow declare that it wasn't everything it was cracked out to be. And please, all you rich and famous people. You know, feedback, please. <laughs> yeah, please bring it back to us. Yeah, yeah. There's this this wonderful mentality that everyone shares, who's not rich and famous, to be rich or famous or and famous, and then they um, have this great burden that they can't shake of being rich and famous. And I kind of kind of find that weird that that would be almost a heaviness or a curse or something that they didn't expect when they spent so much time and energy trying to get to that spot. Where does pride fit into this? Oh, I, 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 I thought pride is, is one of those, those sins, those big sins, right? That, that we think about when we, when we think about who am I, right? Mm -hmm. what, what am I? It's about me. It's a, yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think it does play a role here for us sometimes. It's the innate um, desire to be wanted. Mm hmm rooted in selfishness yeah. yeah yeah that's probably where i land with it too other books that you have on this you know i i don't um and i i find it really really difficult with this particular topic to find a good book however i would say that if somebody can pick up that c.s lewis the, the weight of glory i think that'd be a really really good read mm -hmm. good and you well that's the one that uh, of course bears the story um you know, there's lots of other wonderful books that are written where people are characterized as someone who's been on the outside and they try to get in the inside. And I don't know if it really fulfills the meaning of what we're what we're talking about here, but many people love reading about it because they love the one who who came from the rags and made it to the riches, or were on the outside and now are in, and that is a cultural phenomena that sells. That I don't know if is necessarily true. Um, just like successfulness is something that maybe is not a measuring tool we should talk about as much as faithfulness mm -hmm. and those kind of things. So, you know, and it's curious uh, for me when I when I think about that uh, books. Um, I just keep reminded of the movie Rudy. Oh yeah, right. And yeah. this desire to to play, to be on the team, right. and um, the journey, the journey to try to get. Is it actually end up. But that's that's it. That's all I got. Yeah. So for the Ron and Rick podcast, see you later. Thank you.